1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Verse number 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, wherein ye also have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then all of the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Yeah, man. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Yes. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. Let's pray. Father, we bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for the uh, news of five inmates getting saved by the grace of God this morning. Thank you for that open door. Thank you, Lord, for your tremendous blessing. God, thank you for a good Sunday school hour. Thank you, Lord, for the good singing. Thank you for the good fellowship we've enjoyed with your people today. Thank you for the Word of God. Now, Father, I pray over the next few minutes that you would certainly manifest yourself greatly through the preaching of the Word of God. I pray that your people would be edified. I pray that you would be glorified. But I pray that sinners would be terrified. I pray they'd see their lost condition and see their future without God. Then, Father, I pray that they would turn from their ways and turn unto you and receive you as Lord and Savior Amen. and believe on the Lord and be saved today. Father, I do pray that, Lord, you would uh, certainly uh, help that one that maybe needs to know they're cared for. I pray that, Lord, that one's low, that you'll lift them up. That one that is struggling, you would help them. That one that is overloaded, that, Lord, they would learn to roll their burden upon the Lord, and the Lord would help them and sustain them. Now, Father, use this unworthy vessel, and, Father, have your will and way about, uh, amongst us today. Put a hedge about us. Do not let the wicked one, that sorry, no good devil, interfere in our service. He only seeks to divide and distract but, Lord, we know, we know you came, Lord, to give us life and give it more abundantly. Now, Father, have your will and way amongst us. We will not fail to bow these unworthy heads. And thank you for what great things you will do. Father, ha just bless, do unusual and supernatural things in our midst. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I want to draw your attention to several things from these verses. I want you to notice the pronouncement of importance. Now, there's a lot of announcements and pronouncements made. There's a lot of declarations made. There's a lot of things that are stated. But nothing more important than what the Apostle Paul penned down in verse number 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you receive wherein you stand. Can I say the most important thing that has ever been stated, that has ever been delivered, that has ever been shown to man is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 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 here in a few weeks we'll uh, uh, revisit uh, Luke chapter number 2, what is commonly known as the Christmas story, and the very thing the angel told the shepherds. Uh, she had uh, great news of glad tidings, and what a blessing. Uh, we have glad tidings today, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there's nothing more important than that. Amen. And yet... And some of us give more importance to junk mail that we get in our mailbox sure. than we do the message of the gospel. I want you to notice the personal responsibility in regards to the gospel. In verse number 2 he says, By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, 
unless you believed in vain. He is not saying that if you uh, always remember you got born again, then you'll be born again. No, if you got born again, you're born again forever. But what he is encouraging them is to remember what they put their trust in unless they have believed in vain. You are not saved because your grandma or grandpa were saved. You're not saved because your husband or wife saved. You're not saved because your mom and dad saved. You're not saved because you come to a Baptist church. You're not saved because you've been baptized. Uh, you're not saved because uh, uh, you give good works or you give money to things. Uh, friends, uh, you're only saved if you put your faith and trust in the finished works of, the, of Calvary uh, and you've uh, repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It is a personal responsibility. Brother Ray, I love you, but I couldn't get saved for you. You had to get saved by yourself, for yourself, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know his testimony, talk to him. He got saved in the bend of a road driving a 57 Chevy. How great is that? I mean, I got saved in church. I don't think there's any better place you can ever get saved in his church, but I'm glad God's not limited within the walls of a building. Mm. Can I say this? Notice the point of emphasis that Paul places on the gospel. What is the gospel? Verse number 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. That's the good news. We were sinners. But Christ loved sinners, and he died for sinners, that he was buried, uh, that he rose again, uh, according to the Scriptures. Uh, uh, my dear friends, uh, uh, because he loved you and he loved me, and the only hope we'd have of eternal life would be uh, uh, conditioned upon what he could do for us. Uh, and the real point of emphasis is all about Christ. It's not about the preacher. It's not about the, uh, uh, the church house. It's not about the campaign. It's all about Jesus Christ. And can I say hallelujah for the proof of the resurrection? You know, in Jesus' day, the, the chief priest paid off some to lie in an impeachment, pro I mean in a trial, uh, to say that his disciples came and stole his body away. And can I say it's still reported commonly among the Jews. Yeah. But notice the proof of the resurrection. Verse number 5. He was seen of Cephas. Well, that's just one man's opinion. And then of the twelve. Yeah. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of, of James, then all of the apostles. Uh, and the last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Hmm? Now, unlike, since I brought it up, the impeachment process, this isn't hearsay. Paul said these people have testified and will testify under oath what they saw. This wasn't something they heard, uh, somebody else heard, that somebody else heard, and conjecture. He said, all these people saw him. He said, but if that's not good enough, last of all, I saw him. Mm. He got up out of the grave. Uh, can I say that even science proves it? Because they went over there and done carbon dating in the empty tomb, uh, and they said, never a body decayed in here. Well, I could have told you that. He only used it for three days and three nights uh, to change his wardrobe. Hallelujah. Amen. There's the proof of the resurrection. And then can I say, I want you to notice Paul's humility. Hmm? We have no problem saying Paul's the greatest apostle. If it wasn't for Paul, we probably wouldn't have the gospel today. Amen. We have no problem saying uh, outside the Lord Jesus, and then the Lord said John the Baptist was the greatest born of woman. Outside those two, we'd have to say the apostle Paul's one of the greatest people to ever walk the face of the earth. But not in Paul's eyes. Look what he says in verse number 9. He says, For I'm the least of the apostles. Now, I'm not even meet to be called an apostle. You ever feel like you're not worthy to be able to do anything? Sure. Mm. One other place, Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners. Mm. Mm. He goes on to say, Because I persecuted the church of God. He said, I'm not worthy to be an apostle. Can I help you something? What God does for us is not based on us and how bad we are or how good we think we are. 
It's all based on what Jesus did. He goes on to say this. <laughs> Hallelujah for this verse. But by the grace of God. <laughs> Paul said, I was a murderer. I was a thief. Uh, I was the worst. Uh, 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 there's no way that I, I should be saved, let alone the apostle. Uh, he said, but by the grace of God. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Hey, uh, we were lost and dead and trespasses and sinned, uh, but he quickened us through the Spirit of God. Uh, hallelujah for grace. Amen. Mm. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul's not making an apology that he's an apostle. Right. He said, I'm not worthy to be one, but by the grace of God, I am one. Hallelujah. Yeah. Huh? He said, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. He said, uh, not only was I saved by grace, not only was I called by grace, not only am I an apostle by grace, uh, he said, but I didn't take that for granted. Uh, I didn't get saved and sit down and do it and do nothing. Uh, he said, his grace wasn't in vain on me. Uh, he said, I labored more than anybody else uh, uh, because of what great things God did for me. I want to do great things for him. Uh, that's what grace ought to do to you. You ought to see where you were and what you deserved. And then God came and changed your life and changed your eternity. You ought to have a, a, a desire to do something for God. And then we see the purpose defined. There was an argument in the church at Corinth. Some were saying they got saved under Apollos. Some were saying they got saved under Paul. And some were saying they got saved under somebody else. And some were saying this one baptized me and that one baptized me. And they was all trying to uh, 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 come up with a click. Uh, 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 who was the better Christian based on who they got saved under? Hmm? Paul earlier told them, some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. Well, here he defines it even more clearly. He said this in verse 11. Therefore, whether it were I... Or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Don't matter who was doing the preaching. What matters is that you believed. Hmm? Well, we look at this wonderful passage dealing with the gospel. Can I say that gospel simply defined means glad tidings or good news? And so with that in mind, I want to preach with God's help just for a few minutes this morning. I couldn't get this off my heart, couldn't get off my mind. I want to preach on good news in a day of fake news. Good news in a day of fake news. Now don't get me started, I'll never get to the message, all right? Good news in a day of fake news. What is the good news? For God so loved the world. <laughs> For God so loved the world. <laughs> For God so loved the world Amen. that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Can I say, my dear friends, we were conceived in iniquity. We were brought forth in sin. We were sinners by birth. We were sinners by nature. We were sinners by practice. Uh, 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 friends, we were sinners. Uh, we were condemned to death for the wages of sin was death. Uh, uh, we did not even retain God in our knowledge. We weren't seeking after God. Uh, uh, my dear friends, all we sought after was sin, uh, sinful practices. Uh, and friend, listen, uh, our destination was a devil's hell uh, where we would pay for our own sins for all of eternity. Uh, but God committed his love toward us uh, and that while we were yet sinners uh, Christ died for us uh, I've got good news uh, in a day of fake news uh, Jesus loves you uh, and Jesus died for you uh, the good news is you don't have to go to hell uh, you can be saved uh, what a blessing uh, hey, the greatest news you could ever hear uh, Jesus died for you uh, you don't have to live in sin and live in defeat uh, there is victory uh, you can be be saved from your sins. Uh, can I say this? Uh, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's atonement. 
The Bible says again in Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were the enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement Uh, can I say uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ had to die the death that he did the death of the cross and shed his blood because without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins Uh, and the blood of bulls and lambs and goats uh, could not wash away our sins they were a figurehead a picture that one day God would send his lamb uh, to take away our sins Uh, The only thing that could atone for our sins in the sight of God was His own blood that was shed through His Son. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's atonement. You see me and you say, you're nothing more than a rotten, dirty, no good sinner. Well, you're looking on the outside. See, my sins have been atoned for. My past sins, my present sins, my future sins are forgiven in the person of Christ. I'm not a sinner. Nowhere in the New Testament do you find God saving somebody and referring to them as a sinner. Now we have the ideology, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's not what the Bible, that's not Bible terminology. The Bible says after you get saved, you're a saint. Mm. Huh? Listen, when you see me, you don't see a saint, but when he sees me, he sees himself. He sees purity. He sees holiness. I've been robed in his righteousness because I've been atoned for today. It's not by what I've done. It's what he done for me. He atoned me from my sins. Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins uh, according to the riches of his grace. God did more than forgive me of my sins. He atoned me yes, sir. from my sin. Yes, sir. You can forgive somebody, but that doesn't mean... Uh, that there is a, 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 all the, a, a, the, the, the gap has been bridged. When he forgave me, he atoned me. He atoned me and he justified me, Brother Clint, which simply means, again, wrong Bible terminology. People today say I'm justified as if I, I've never sinned. No, no, no. He justified me as if I'd never been a sinner because I'm atoned for my sin huh? it's more than just a pardon it's a complete cleansing from as if I'd never been I'm more than just a new creation as the modern texts say I'm a new creature in Christ he remade me in his sight he doesn't see me as I am he sees me as what I will be in him hmm? can I say that's good news in the gospel of Christ there's atonement can I say not only that there's acceptance he had no idea what I was preaching on I had no idea what he was going to sing I just liked hearing him sing but I've got good news in a world defined by bullies and, and being an outcast and never living up to and never being good has anybody seen that new deal that's out you buy this mirror and you work out in front of it and somebody's looking in on the other side telling you how, to, how you're not doing a good job Huh? If I got a mirror, I don't need somebody to tell me how, how I look. I already know how I look, and it's not a pretty picture. I don't need somebody up there telling me I need to do more push ups and straighten my back and do all this. I'd be throwing something through that mirror. I can guarantee you right now. I don't know what it costs, but it, it'd be going back and cracked. Are you listening? Huh? We live in a day and age where billions are spent on uh, uh, making yourself look better and make yourself feel better about yourself because you got to meet the standards of what everybody else thinks is pretty and acceptable. Yep, sure. Can I say, no matter how, how well you do it, that you never get to where you're good enough. Nope. Right. Except in Christ. Can I say, Jesus will take you just as you are and he'll make a new creature out of you. And my dear friends, he'll change you for now and eternity. And can I say, you're always accepted in him. Hmm? 
the Father accepts us through the Son. And can I say there's something even greater? Because God don't speak to us, Brother Phil, in an audible voice. He didn't wake you up today and say, Phil, go to the jail and preach. He speaks to us through his word. And, but God knows where, because he built us. He designed us. He fashioned us. He formed us in his own image. And God made us a people of emotions. We have emotions and feelings and all. And it's wonderful knowing that God loves us and so we can read that, but sometimes we need human interaction. Somebody, sometimes we need somebody. That's why he gave us the church. Can I say the church isn't supposed to be a battleground? The church isn't supposed to be a courtroom whereby judges one another. The church is to be an oasis. It's to be a home away from home. The church is to be a place where we can come and worship the Lord, but also draw strength from one another. And the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Aren't you glad there's no big eyes or little U's in the church? Aren't you glad you can come into the house of God amongst your kind? and be accepted. I've said this before. Outside the grace of God, most of us would never, ever hang out with one another. We all have different likes, different passions. We come from different places. Uh, 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 we live in different addresses. Uh, uh, some of us are hillbillies. Some of us are Yankees. I mean, we just would not flow. But isn't it amazing how the Spirit of God takes up His residence in our lives and He firmly and fitly joins us together. And we can come from all facets of life. We have college professors in here and we have people that can't even read or write. Uh, we have people from all different backgrounds, all different uh, 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 financial statuses, but none of that matters. Uh, when we come together, the only thing that matters is Christ uh, and what He's done for us. Uh, and we all come together because the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Uh, and we, my dear friends, uh, uh, can have fellowship uh, and draw strength uh, and pray for one another and love on one another and encourage one another. Huh? In the gospel of Christ, there's acceptance. You don't have to be good enough because Christ was. And in Him, you're perfect. You, there's no need for improvement in Him. Hmm? Oh, He still works on us. I got a lot of rough edges. I've been saved 45 years. I haven't got a halo yet. A lot of rough edges on me. Hey, you don't believe it? Ask Miss Annette. She's made a big difference in my life. 31 years, she's knocked some of them off. Uh, but the Lord's still working on us. And that's the beauty about coming together. We realize none of us in our flesh are perfect. And we can encourage and help and love one another. Can I say this? In the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's assurance. I'm glad I have hope. Man, you look around this world, there's no hope in this world. Thank God the economy's doing great. But if the, if the one crowd on the one side of the aisle has their way, it's going back into the tank. We're all going to be socialists. Hmm. Amen. There's a lot of people put all their stock in the stock market. A lot of people put all their hope and all their dreams based on their jobs. Do you know how many companies have merged in the last 20 years? and done away with employees and raised up a new and by the way you get up my age they want to get rid of you you cost too much on the insurance plan they want to hire somebody right out of college and making half the money and costing them less on benefits Amen. there's no stability in this world but I'm glad there's assurance in the gospel uh, I'm glad I can be assured that I'm saved and I'm glad that I'm, I can not only be assured that I'm saved but I can be assured that uh, Everything's all right in God's economy. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. Hallelujah. Uh, they can take everything they want from me, but they can't take my soul. I have eternal life. I don't hope to have eternal life. I have eternal life. Hmm? And this life is in His Son. I have eternal life because I have Him. Hmm? He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Right. Hmm? I don't need a modern version to explain that to me. It's very simple. If you got Jesus, you got life. If you don't, you don't have life. That's right, Pastor. 
And then he says this, These things have I written unto you. Why do we put so much emphasis on the word of God? Because you're saved by an incorruptible seed. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Through the Bible, through the Scriptures, we know that God framed the world. Through the Bible, we have the Gospel. And through the Bible, we have assurance of our salvation. I know I'm saved because I've done what God said I needed to do to be saved. Hmm? In the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's assurance. I'm glad I'm not built on sinking sand. I'm built on the rock of ages, and his name is Jesus. And there's hope. Not only hope for today, but there's eternal hope and a blessed hope. And thank God for assurance. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's access. Now, I couldn't get a hold of the governor. I couldn't get a hold of the president. I couldn't get a hold of our senators. They ought to be thankful for that. I couldn't get a hold of anybody. A lot of times I can't even get a hold of you and you can't get a hold of me. But there's somebody I always have access to. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, I who once was outside have been made nigh through the blood of Christ. But can I say I have access to him. 1 Timothy 2.3 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Amen. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I have access to God directly and have privilege through the Scriptures that I can boldly come to His throne anytime, anywhere, and I can always have an audience with God through the gospel. When I got saved, I didn't know all this stuff. Amen. All I knew is a burden was lifted. Sure. All I knew is uh, uh, I, uh, I had been tore up thinking about all this stuff, but when I got born again, all of a sudden I had peace. Right. All of a sudden uh, I had joy that I never knew. All of a sudden, I couldn't wait to tell somebody else what had just happened to me. I did not know uh, that I had access to the throne room of God, uh, that I can walk into the midst of God anytime, anywhere through the avenue of prayer. Hmm. That was a miracle that he met with the Prime Minister of St. Lucia. No way he's meeting with the Prime Minister of St. Lucia unless God's in what we endeavor to do down on the island. No way he's meeting had we not prayed that God would open the doors. Hmm? I want to say something. We always have access to God. Through the gospel. Can I say this? In the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's an anchor. Life itself is uncertain. We know not what a day brings forth. Job said, man's days are few and full of trouble. But through the gospel, you get an anchor that you can establish your life around. The Bible says in Hebrews 6, 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. Our anchor is Jesus himself. Amen. Heard this illustration one time, it's wonderful. A fellow said he'd watched a tugboat go out and a big ocean liner had come close to the seashore and, and got as far in as he could go and his tugboat went out and they dropped the anchor into the tugboat and the tugboat uh, took the anchor and dropped it into the harbor and they started reeling that big ship in through that uh, uh, strong chain and that anchor. They dropped the anchor where it needed to be and they brought the ship in right where it needed to be. If you're saved, you're into the good old gospel ship. And our anchors already went within the veil. He's already in glory, seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, and we're tied to Him through the Holy Ghost. Uh, and He's just reeling us in home. Uh, one day we're going to make it to Harbor. Uh, and all of our troubles will be over. 
Can I say our anchor is steadfast and sure. You don't have to worry about him, huh? He's the rock of ages. Uh, hey, listen, uh, 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 the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness uh, and be content with such things you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I have an anchor that will never leave me, never forsake me. He is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Oh, thank God for the anchor. Oh, when my life is in a turmoil... I'm glad I have an anchor that centers me and gives me comfort and assurance. Can I say this? Through the gospel, there's an abundant life. Amen. Now, you listen to these TV preachers. They promise a lot of stuff they can't back up. Right. They'll say, you send them $1,000, God's going to send you 10000 You send them $1,000, you're going to be broke. Yeah. God don't operate that way. You can't buy a blessing from God. The only condition that God blesses you with, the only reason He blesses you and I, the only condition put on God's blessing is the fact that He loves you. Hmm? He lets it rain on the just and the unjust alike. And this uh, 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 TV crowd, they preach a bunch of prosperity. You know what? They don't preach the gospel. All they preach for is to line their pockets. Uh, and for you to sow seed in their ministry. Can I help you something? Anything bypasses local church is wrong. You're welcome. It didn't cost you anything. Amen. But can I say, Jesus never promised you a life of prosperity as the world knows uh, prosperity. But can I say, <laughs> I have lived a prosperous life. Jesus said this in John 10.10. 10. He says, uh, The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Can I say in being saved, I've lived an abundant life. I am reaping far better than I sow. God has been a lot better to me than I ever deserved. Are you listening? Hmm? I like them songs like, Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. I got a roof over my head, food on my table, shoes on my feet. Can I say that's, that's the bare necessities? Matthew 6 says he knows what you have need of. But can I say he not only meets my needs, he lets me live an abundant life. I have, I have peace, joy, love, mercy. I, I have the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit in my life. Uh, I have friends. Uh, I have uh, far more than I ever deserved. Uh, through the gospel, there's an abundant life. And let me say this lastly. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's the boat of God awaiting. Oh, yeah. mm. Jesus about ready to go to Calvary. Looks over, he's told his disciples several times, but kind of like us, when he tells us through preaching, a lot of times we just don't pay much attention. Goes in one ear and out the ear, other. He told them he's going to Jerusalem, going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, he's going to crucify him. But finally, he, he got their attention. He said, look, boys. They're going to crucify me. He said, I got to go away. Boy, they got all upset. This is what he said. He said, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Huh? Can I say there's an abode of God? The glory of God. I mean, I mean, when folks talk about heaven, they talk about New Jerusalem, they talk about streets of gold and mansions and, and gates of pearl and walls of jasper and all those things, and that's going to be there, friend. But as I like to point out, you don't go out there and worship God because we've got asphalt. Can I say the most disgusting thing in heaven, the streets of gold? I mean, we don't, tar is nothing to us. That's the most disgusting thing in heaven is gold. Hmm? What is going to make heaven? Heaven is God's abode. We are going to abide with God. We're going to be in the presence of Almighty God, the very one that created us. We're going to be there and worship Him. Hey, we'll be elevated above the angels. People write books about angels. Who cares about angels? I care about Jesus. That's the one I'm going to see. Hey, we'll be in the abode of God forevermore. Amen. And I say without the gospel, all that there really is is dread, dysfunction, and damnation. Amen. Life's a lot better on the right side of the gospel. Right. I've said all that to say this this morning. 
there's good news in a world of fake news and false news, hypocritical news, and bad news. The good news is Jesus loves you. He died for you, and he wants to save you from your sin. You remember when I said there's a personal responsibility? If I could get saved for you, I'd, I'd get saved for you. That's how I know that TV crowd's fake. If I had the power of healing, there wouldn't be a hospital in, vi in business. Hmm. They don't have all that stuff. They're just trying to make money. But I do have the gospel. And if I could get saved for you, I would, because if you could see how wonderful it is being saved, you'd get saved. Everybody sitting here that's got saved said they wish they'd got saved sooner. But see, I can't get saved for you. All I can do is tell you that you need to be saved. Tell you that Jesus loves you and He will save you. Amen. And tell you how to be saved. But friend, you have to make up your mind. You want to be saved. You have to turn from your sinful life and turn to the Lord and ask Him to save you. Now can I say people have all these, these false things in their mind because the devil's crafty. He'll tell you, before you get saved, you've got to give up this and give up that. and give. I didn't give up nothing. I got saved and Jesus changed my life. I promise you if, you, if you give your heart to Jesus, He'll change your life. You don't have to give up anything. He'll change you from the inside out. That's right. And people have the mindset, well, I'm not good enough. Nobody was. There's none good but God. And you'll have the mindset, well, what will all these people think? Well, let me help you something. All these people in here that are saved sat where you sit at one time Amen. and finally got so miserable being a sinner they said to forget it I'm getting saved <laughs> and you know what they think about you they think Lord please save that person the so they can experience the joy I'm experiencing so they can experience you like I'm experiencing you God save them you know what they'll think they'll think hallelujah they got saved and you'll find that probably some of the greatest people you've ever made on, you'll ever meet in your life is in this building today. People that won't walk out on you when you're troubled. People that'll pray for you. People that'll encourage you. People that'll help you. There's people here that love you and you don't even know it. Say, so how can they love me? Because they have the love of God in their heart. How could Jesus love us as sinners? I don't know. But he does. And when folks get saved, you know what they do? They love sinners too. If you're here today and you're not saved... We're going to have an invitation. Just a fancy word. We're going to invite you to come and get saved. Amen. Say, preacher, I don't know how to get saved. You come and we'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you what the Bible says about being saved. You can get saved today. There's good news for you today. What greater day to get saved than today? As a matter of fact, today is the day of salvation. You have no promise of tomorrow. You got right now. We invite you to come. Give your heart and life to Jesus. Don't let the devil throw any excuses to keep you from getting saved. I got good news. You can get saved, and you can get saved today. If you're here today and you're saved, when's the last time you thanked God for the gospel? <coughs> Maybe you need to come and say, God, burden my heart for somebody that I can take the gospel to. Maybe you just need to come and thank the Lord for saving you. Maybe you want to just to come and tell him you love him. I don't know, but I know one thing. He's worthy of our praise, and he's worthy to be worshiped. But I do know one thing. He wouldn't have me preach this message unless there was people that didn't need to hear it. Amen. If you're here today and you're saved, i got great news. Jesus loves you. He wants to save you. The real question is, will you be saved? It's up to you. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. Father, come and let's pray. Father, we love you. We're so thankful for the gospel. God, none of us are worthy of it, but we sure are appreciative of it. Lord, I fear in a crowd this size there are folks that aren't saved. And Father, I've done the best of my ability to preach what you put on my heart. So I pray the sweet Holy Spirit would now speak to people. Lord, it's getting a little stuffy in here because it's getting warmer outside. Folks getting a little uncomfortable. It's a lot more uncomfortable than this in hell today. God, I pray sinners would be made real uncomfortable right now. I pray the Holy Ghost would convict them, let them know they're a sinner. But then through cords of love, He'll draw them to Christ, who shows them that He loved sinners and died for them. 
God help sinners in here today realize you died for them and you want to save them. There's good news for them today. They can be saved. They can understand the atonement of God. They'll just give their heart to Jesus. God, I pray sinners get saved. I pray the saints of God would really get thankful for being saved. Get a burden to go tell somebody else the good news in this day. God, speak to hearts in this invitation. And God, whatever you design for the, for the hour, your will be done. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.